Hello. Today I want to talk to you about conversation analysis, which, as the name indicates, are the, the concepts uh, and tools involved in describing and analyzing how spoken language works, and in particular conversation, which for linguists is a very special and uh, unique part of spoken language, especially because it's so often used primarily for social purposes and not to communicate meaning, not to teach people, not to get things done, not to uh, do anything other than express uh, a social relationship that one is either building or maintaining with someone else. So first, I'd like to try to convince you that thinking about the structure of a spoken interaction is valuable for helping us determine what's going on, right? Look at this, you have nine lines of text, all spoken by one person, A, and you don't know what the words are. You just know that A, I've just used X's, right? A is talking, so what do we see here? A is talking, one long extended turn, no one else is talking. Uh, there appear to be few, there are no pauses marked or anything, just words. Think for a minute, what kind, what genre, as I wrote, what genre of interaction is this? What is A doing when she or he talks like this? I hope you're thinking of something where you have one speaker talking for an extended amount of time, like a lecture such as I'm doing now, or perhaps a religious ceremony, uh, although some parts of a religious ceremony are interactive, of course, some parts aren't, perhaps a speech, uh, by a political figure, something like that, right, is what you'd expect when you see a transcription like this, just one person talking. What's going on here? Here you'll probably be thinking, okay, so this has got two speakers, and the turns are much shorter, and they're taking turns going back and forth, and it's probably some kind of interaction. It could be a conversation, could be at the doctor's office, right? It looks to me in line one that A is asking a question and B is just saying yes. Uh, and then A asks another question, B says, uh-huh, or something like that, right? We don't know exactly, but we can see, okay, this is a different kind of social interaction because there's two people and their turns are reasonably similar. B starts to take longer turns in line six and eight, right? So something different is going on. And we know that without knowing the words, just because you know the structure, you know two people are involved, you know that they're taking turns, and you know something about the length of the turns. What's going on here? Notice nothing's really changed except that there is now a third speaker involved, right? And now once you have three people, A, then B, then A, then C, then A, then C, now you probably get a much stronger feeling that this would have to be a conversation and not necessarily a doctor-patient interaction. It, again, it doesn't have to be, but this is much more likely what we'd see in a conversation amongst three people, right? They take turns and they go back and forth a bit, but there's no real order. You don't go A, B, C, A, B, C like it was an organized debate. Uh, there's uh, short turns and longer turns, but none of them are too long. Nobody ever wants to talk too long in a conversation or you end up feeling like you're dominating and the other people may feel like they're not getting a chance and no one likes that, right? Uh, and uh, how about this one? One person talks, then the other person talks for a much longer time. B takes a multi-line turn from lines two to seven and then A talks again, and then B much longer. And I'm giving you time to think. Perhaps this probably feels something like an interview to me, that A is perhaps the interviewer and B is the interviewee. A is saying, you want to work for our company. Uh, could you please tell us about the skills that you have that are applicable here? And then B is saying, well, I've got a lot of experience with A, B, and C, right? Perhaps an interview. And finally, as it says this, now this one, you got to look carefully at lines five and 10. Here, you're supposed to be thinking that many people, B, C, D, E, F, G, so, uh, but, uh, you know, but it's not necessarily just that many, that there's a whole bunch of people talking at one. Oh, sorry. Of course, I wrote it here. Many people are saying the same thing in unison, right? A talks, and then many people say the same thing in unison. 
and maybe now you'd be thinking, what could this be? Uh, some sort of ritualized interaction, right? Perhaps a religious ceremony where A is the, the religious leader and A is talking, and then in lines 5 and lines 10, the, the congregants all answer simultaneously, or perhaps a political speech where A is talking and then B and Z have a set response. Uh, uh, former U.S. President Barack Obama was known for this. He'd talk and then he'd say something along the lines of, can we do it? And all of the audience would say, yes, we can. Uh, something like that, right? So B and Z to be talking in unison, they often, they, they, B participants B through Z to be talking in unison obviously need to know something about what's expected of them and so have to uh, uh, be prepared, right? So this has to be some sort of ceremonial thing or, or planned, right? We don't a we probably think A's turn in line one through four and six through nine is not planned. She or he can say whatever at that point, but B and Z have to know precisely what to say in order to talk in unison at that point. So the point of all this is to tell you that what we have here is spoken language, and we know a little bit about what's going on because we know that we know how many speakers, but all we know is how many speakers there are and a bit about the nature of the interaction. But we don't know the content. We don't know anything about the words, but that doesn't matter to us, right? It doesn't matter. It still helps us to figure out what's going on. So that's at the heart of what conversation analysis is, right? Looking at the structure of a conversation, looking at how the turns work in relation to each other and being able to make some uh, descriptions uh, of what's going on and to analyze why things are happening the way they do. And it's, as I said, without needing to know the words, when people analyze language, they tend to just focus on the words. They'll say this word means that, this word is rude, that word is formal, that word is scientific, and that's very useful. But we should also be focusing on the grammar, of course, and this, which people often don't think about at all, is that we can also focus on the structure of the interaction. Whether it's written or spoken, you can focus on the structure. Most of us have a lot more experience looking at the structure of written language. As we're learning, we learn to write sentences and paragraphs, and we learn to have an introductory paragraph and a body section of the essay and then a concluding paragraph, and that's great. We can do the same kind of things with spoken language, look at how the spoken interaction works in terms of structure in order to understand the context of the interaction and the relationship between the participants and so on. <clears throat> so we talk about things like this, right? The, de the descriptive terms to describe language, uh, turns, how do we talk about turns properly, and can we make predictions about who will be talking next? And we'll come to these one by one throughout this talk. Now, the, the main uh, article, the, the main work of, of uh, scholarship that discussed this in the first place is by three people called Sachs, Shegloff, and Jefferson, uh, Harvey Sachs, Emmanuel Shegloff, and Gail Jefferson. Everybody who studies language knows about their article called, it's got a big long title that I'll probably get wrong here, but A Simplest Systematics for the Organization of Turn Taking in Conversation. This is very well known because they started to write down the rules of conversation and to explain this thing that for many of us, we were never taught formally. This is how you have a conversation. We learned it through informal means. If we talk at the same time as someone else, perhaps our parents, they frown at us and say, please wait while I'm talking to you. But they only say that it's sometimes, at other times, it's okay to talk at the same time as each other, right? So when I say that Sachs, Shegloff, and Jefferson wrote down the rules of conversation, I don't mean rules that you must follow, but rather rules that we tend to follow if we want a conversation to work properly, if we want to get along with people and have a nice social interaction, we tend to do these things, right? So what, th what they first did, Zach Shagloff and Jefferson, is said, okay, let's define what is conversation. And they use these five 
rules to define it, right? These five, uh, sorry, these five elements to define a conversation. It's not primarily practical. You're not trying to get something done. In linguistics, what we are doing right now, me talking to you, is not a conversation. You couldn't say, well, Sean was having a conversation. Even You couldn't even say Sean was having a one-way conversation, right? And if you're uh, meeting, if you're calling um, to get the, if your broadband is broken and you're calling your internet service provider to talk to them about getting it fixed, you can't, you can say I'm having a conversation with my ISP to get my internet fixed, but in linguistics, that's not a conversation because you're calling them for a practical reason because you want to get your internet working again, right? A conversation is not primarily practical. You're there to be social, right? You're talking to someone you like because you like them and you want to spend time with them. And one way we spend time with people we like is to talk. There are other ways, of course. You can play games, watch a film, uh, have a game of tennis, whatever. But talk is one primarily non-practical way that we talk to people. Uh, that we spend time with people we like. Unequal power is partially suspended. When we're having a conversation, the participants are equal in the sense that they all get equal, roughly equal amounts of time to talk. Um, no one manages the conversation, right? In a classroom, for example, the teacher manages the conversation, right? The teacher will say, please read chapter two, in other words, managing the actions of the students. But the teacher will also say, who knows the answer to question one? Uh, who can tell me about uh, something about this country we're studying and so on? So the teacher is managing the interaction. Uh, so that's not a conversation. The teacher is talking with the students, but it's not a conversation because the teacher's in charge, right? Whereas a conversation, no one's in charge. Or, and even if someone, even if there is a power differential, we pretend there isn't, right? In the classroom, I'm in charge, right? In the sense that I ask people to read this, uh, talk about that, tell me about this. If I meet you by chance on the street, you don't expect me to manage the interaction in the same way, right? You don't expect me to come up and say, there are three things I want to tell you since I've met you here on the street. You think, what's going on? Doesn't this guy understand that this is not the same kind of interaction as we have in the classroom? Of course not, right? Uh, when we meet on the street, we're much more likely to have a conversation. How are you doing? Oh, do you live around here? I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I've lived here a long time. That kind of thing, right? We pretend, even though in theory, I'm still in charge in the sense that, well, I'm the teacher and you're the student, which has a sort of a power relationship behind the discourse, but in the discourse itself, we don't act that way, right? We, we pretend that we're just two acquaintances who met on the street. Number of participants is quite small, that makes sense, right? There's no exact number, but you know what happens when there's three people talking, it's fine, four, five, people start coming into the kitchen while you're having a, a family dinner or something, uh, and more people start coming in, eventually split into two groups and these people talk and those people talk, right? Somewhere around four, five, six, you end up splitting into different groups because we can't really have a proper conversation with too many people. You start to need a manager with too many people, right? Someone to say, oh, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you want to comment, right? It becomes like a business meeting. Turns are quite short, makes sense. Uh, if someone talks too long, at once, it becomes a lecture, right? You don't feel like this is a conversation anymore if your friend is really going on and on and on and not giving you any chance to talk. You'll accept it sometimes, of course. She's just lost her job. Uh, his father's just died and they want to talk a lot. You'll accept that, of course. But generally, we expect reasonably short turns and for them to go back and forth, right? Number five, talk is for the participants, not an audience. Uh, people are not... I mean, a, a scripted conversation in a television drama is not really a conversation, right? It, it's got the appearance of a conversation amongst fictional characters, but really it's designed so that the people who are watching the television program, the film, can enjoy the, the drama, right? Uh, the talk is for the participants in a conversation, that people are talking for themselves. Uh, some of those television talk shows where there's a bunch of panelists who discuss the news or who discuss sports or what have you. Those are not conversations. They're pretending it's a conversation, 
uh, by having informal, quick turns between one another, but really they're there to entertain the audience. I mean, we can even see the way they sit, right? At a conversation at the cafe, you sit around the table. On those programs, they sit uh, in a semicircle because the camera is here, right? That's not a conversation. Okay, that's what a conversation is. And see, you'll think, well, why do you take so long? I know what a conversation is. Yeah, but if you want to use the term precisely in linguistics, it's this, right? So if there's a practical purpose, that's the one that people skip over most often. They tend to, I mean, non-linguists, they use the word conversation to mean a spoken language interaction amongst a few people. But if in linguistics, really, it has to be the not primarily practical thing, right? So you're not having a conversation when you set up a new bank account. You're not having a conversation when you talk about, uh, when you do group work and talk about how to complete your assessment. Let's just look at an earlier model of spoken interaction called the exchange structure, which is good in that it's very clear how this process works. We have names and we can apply them to the parts of a spoken interaction. So it's good. And I'll show you how this works. But then, and, but then when it comes to conversation, you have to realize that conversation analysis is a bigger model because it has more factors to account for. Look, an exchange structure has these three parts. Initiation, response, follow-up, IRF. Teachers and students are talking. What happens here? The teacher in lines one and two says, what color are the mountain ranges? They're looking at a map, right? And the child is learning to read a map and the blue is ocean and green are forests and so on. The teacher asks, what color are the mountain ranges? The student says brown. The teacher says, yes, good. You have the initiation in line one, right? The teacher starts this interaction up, this little interaction. Line one and two, what color are the mountain ranges? The student responds in line three, brown. And the teacher follows up. Or sometimes the follow-up is called evaluate, initiation response, evaluate. That looks more applicable here, right? The teacher evaluates the student's answer. Because imagine if the student was wrong, if the teacher said, what color are the mountain ranges? And the student in line three said blue, then the teacher would evaluate differently, right? The teacher would say, hmm, look again, or no, uh, those are the oceans, right? Something like that. So the evaluation happens there. And you can see also how this only works in a certain direction, right? Uh, the teacher starts the initiation, the student responds, and then the teacher does the follow-up or the evaluation. If it happens the other way, students sometimes ask me questions, right? They'll say, Sean, can you please remind me of uh, the, th the four types of politeness according to Brown and Levinson? The student it initiates. Then I respond. I'd say, well, it's on record, off record, and so on. That give them the four types. I won't get into that now because I don't want you thinking about that. What happens next? The student says something like, I see, or the student says, okay, thanks. But they never evaluate, right? They never say, you know, Sean, what are the four types? And I say, one, two, three, four. And then the student goes, oh, great answer. Well done. It doesn't happen, right? The evaluation. I mean, I'm not saying it could never happen, but it just doesn't, right? Why not? Don't, don't you think I want some positive affirmation? Uh, and yet it doesn't, right? So there's something about the power relationship there that people with more power... And you realize by more power, just to be clear, I'm not saying there's anything about the one person being better than the other, and I'm not saying the power always exists in all situations. But in a teacher-student interaction, the teacher has the power in the sense that the teacher is allowed to ask questions, or and the student is too, but the teacher tends to ask the questions, and the teacher is allowed to evaluate, right? Whereas the student doesn't feel empowered to evaluate the teacher's responses, not to her or his face, right? Of course, outside of class, students all the time may say, that guy's a terrible teacher, Sutherland, I wish I'd never see him again, right? But in the classroom, that doesn't happen. So the exchange structure, right, happens in any of these situations where you have that power differential in a quiz show, right? You'll see something like this, right? And there's the initiation, which country is not in the Commonwealth, there's a response, Philippines, 
uh, another initiation, are you sure that it's the Philippines? Another response, yes, I'm sure. Another final initiation, this is of course not necessary, but it's to create a bit of tension in a quiz show. And then finally you get the follow-up or the evaluation. It's the right answer, you've got 8,000 pounds. Uh, doctors and patients, we see this, right? Same sort of pattern. I won't go through line by line because uh, you can pause and read it, but you do see something happens in lines four and five that's different where the patient inserts a new sequence, right? Line three, the doctor says, what did you eat yesterday? And the response doesn't come till line six. I don't remember what I ate yesterday. But we have an inserted sequence in line four and five where the patient says, what did I eat? And the doctor says, uh-huh, that happens a lot, right? A says, do you want to go to a film tomorrow? B can respond with yes, no, or maybe. Or B can insert a sequence. Uh, do you want to go to A? Do you want to go to a film tomorrow? B, what time? A, 2.30. B, what should we see? A, Spider-Man. B, okay, let's go. A only B only finally responds to the initial question after two inserted sequences. So that's a useful term to remember, an insertion sequence, right? We have sequences in language. The whole conversation is like this long, but we can break it up into sequences, which is a very useful thing to do. And then think about this one as being inserted, lines four and five are inserted between the main sequence of line three and line six. The initiation response follow-up. I skipped over that last slide because it's a better summary here. None of those are conversations. Those are practical, right? The doctor wants to help fix your health. Uh, the quiz show you're trying to win a prize of 8,000 pounds or whatever it said. Uh, the teacher is trying to teach the student. None of these things apply. So those aren't conversations. But the, the, I, I like that people can think about that as what you're doing here, though, right? You're saying, okay, there's a, a, a linguistic event. How can we label the parts, initiation, response, follow-up, and see how those parts apply to various types of context, quiz show, doctor's office, classroom. Conversation analysis attend, attempts to do the same thing, except it, for in a conversation, there are many more possibilities uh, available to us than just the simple initiate, response, follow-up, evaluate. But the principle is the same. We want to look at spoken interactions that are not primarily practical uh, and so on as the other rules, the other uh, elements of the definition here. We want to look at conversations and say, how can we label them? Uh, how can we label the parts in order to understand how people know how to take part in conversations when we probably never had any explicit instruction about how to do so. Conversation analysis is an, a form of ethno-methodology, right? Ethno-methodology is a long word that's easily broken down. Ethno, people, right? Ethno is people. Everyone is an ethno, an ethnic of some type, right? Method, way of doing. Ology, study of. Right? Ethnomethodology is the study of people's ways of doing things. But it applies especially to our ways of doing things that we are never or rarely formally instructed about how to do. Right, As I said before, we don't tend to be instructed uh, explicitly into how to have a conversation. We learn it from listening to conversations when we're young, from partaking in conversations with our our families and granny and auntie and uncle and teacher and so on, right? Looking for order or patterns in things that might be thought to be naturally occurring. Conversations are not naturally occurring. We don't naturally know how to have a conversation. We learn the order, we learn the patterns by growing up surrounded by people who have conversations. Key areas of interest have to do with describing conversations, with talking about the turns in conversations, and with talking about the change between speakers. And we'll go over those in more detail. So the first thing to talk about is turn construction units. Every time, when one person talks, that's a turn, right? You have the whole conversation, you can break it up into segments, 
you may have the greeting segment. Hey, how you doing? Fine, you great. Hey, I was wanting to talk to you about right. So you got the greeting segment, then the next segment. Con conversations can be broken into segments. Each segment has turns, right? When I say, how are you? That's a turn. You say, I'm fine. That's a turn. I say, great, because last time I saw you, you told me you weren't feeling well. That's a turn. The length doesn't matter. It's just how when one person talks and keeps talking until the end of his or her turn, that's the turn, right? Uh, when we're talking about written language, we often talk about sentences as the units of written language. You read a novel, it's broken up into chapters, the chapters are broken up into, into uh, uh, paragraphs, the paragraphs are broken up into sentences, like that, right? That doesn't happen with spoken language. In spoken language, we have different names for the units. We don't tend to talk in sentences. Look at this, right? J goes, the H is a bit of an inhalation. So we decided to go to that place, and H says, where's that? J says, over near DJ's. H says, oh, I haven't seen it. So what's going on here? Uh, only the first and second line, uh, sorry, not only, the first and second line are both made up of full clauses. But if you look at line three, over near DJ's, that's just a phrase, right? It starts with a preposition over, and then it has the rest of the phrase. It's a prepositional phrase, not a sentence. And, uh, and, but an informal written language, you'd be expected to use full sentences, subject, verb, object, right? Uh, or subject, verb, and maybe an object. Here in spoken language, we aren't expected to do so. Look at this one that's even more fragmented. Line one, T says, what kind of work do you do? M says, food service. T says, act. M says, uh, the post office cafeteria downtown. Look at how they're making, the two people are working together to make one sentence. Uh, what kind of food service do you do is a clause, which could be a full sentence, right? Line two, food service is just a phrase. Line three, at is just a word, right? A single preposition. And then line four has the uh, and then another phrase. What are we doing here, or what are they doing? T says, what kind of work do you do? M says, I work uh, at food service. T says, you work at food service at where? M says, I work at food service at the post office cafeteria downtown. They're going back and forth and not saying everything because they're borrowing the grammar from the turns before. Uh, you don't need to say like in line four, M doesn't say need to say the rest of it. If if someone else arrived just as M said, uh, the post office cafeteria downtown, the new person who just arrived at that point wouldn't understand what's going on. But of course, T understands that M in line four means I work at food service at the post office cafeteria downtown. So this bit of the conversation is made up of these little units, very little in the case of line three, slightly longer for lines two and so on, made up of these little units that we move around and plunk together in order to make our turns. So you have the turn, but it can be made up of various lengths of unit within the turn, and some turns can have more than one unit, as we'll see. If you look at this, line one, A says, oh, that guy, I don't think I like him. That's one, set, that's one turn, right? Not one sentence. One turn. Oh, that guy, I don't think I like him. But if you want to talk about what A has done here, you have to realize that you can break it into three units, three separate parts. You have the O, which is often used as a, O is a, called a discourse marker, which you can talk about at another time, but it marks something changing in the discourse, right? You, you If you hear someone say, oh, you know they've just realized something, or they're pretending at least that they just realized something. You can imagine someone else said, do you see him over at the corner? And A looks over and realizes, oh, as in, oh, I know that guy, right? So O, o does the marking of surprise, slight surprise, right? It's often called a surprise discourse marker or unexpected, marks the unexpectedness. Oh, that guy, that guy, O is a word, that guy 
is a phrase and it's used to do the pointing, the verbal pointing, right? That guy. And then I don't think I like him gives us the a full clause where A actually comments on that guy. You have one turn, but it's broken into three units. A word, oh, a phrase, that guy, a clause, I don't think I like him. And it's useful to be able to break it into those three parts in order to talk about the different function of the blue part, the red part, and the green part, right? You have the word length. This is how you can describe these. You can say, O is a word length TCU. That guy is a phrase length TCU. I don't think I like him is a clause length TCU. You have one turn that's made up of three TCUs. And as I did previously, starting by breaking a, a, a turn into the units that compose it allows you to then analyze them as individual parts. You can't really say what what A's purpose in line one. A has three purposes here. People are very good at thinking ahead. We're so used to knowing about this idea of units that we can think ahead and understand when someone's getting to the end of a unit, right? Jay's telling a joke here uh, about a, a man who hid a dog in a closet so it would bite his wife. Uh, Jay says he wanted the dog to bite his wife. C says, eh? Jay says, so he comes home one night and C starts laughing at the same time as Jay says, comes home, home one night, C's going, ha, ha, ha. And Jay says, and the animal, and C knows, because partly from the content, but partly from understanding the structure of turns and the, and the units. Even, I mean, I'm not saying C knows the term turn construction unit, but C knows how to talk, as do all of us. We know how to talk. All we're doing here is saying, what are the, how can we explain how we know how to talk? How can we slow down a conversation in order to explain how people so quickly can take part in a conversation? The brain is working so quickly, the vocal system in order to interact so quickly here that C can just predict what Jay was going to say and they both say it at the same time, right? And the animal bit him. Same kind of thing here. D is talking. They have to run programs for them to rehabilitate them and to deal with the new materials. And if they can't, and A is able to predict an ending. It may not, A may not be predicting the exact words that D would have used here. A says they're out. But we can see from line five that D is obviously satisfied that that's a successful completion to the turn because D says, mm-hmm. So D evaluates the turn as being... Uh, successful, whether or not the same words matter, were there, doesn't matter. It's the function, A's function of providing a summary for D's turns in lines one to three. A's function is to summarize. D says, mm -hmm, I accept that summary. People do this all the time, right? You hear people say things like, they get along really well. They finish each other's sentences. It, we can finish each other's sentences, even if we don't get along well, even if we don't know each other, because we're good at evaluating content, what someone's talking about, but also evaluating structure. How does someone talk and what type of unit is necessary, word, phrase, clause, and what type of content in that unit, as he was able to do in line four, the content needed here is a summary or a, rather a, a, an effect. This is a cause and effect. If you do that, you're, you win. If you do that, you lose. Well, here is an if you do that, you're out. How do we know when turns are complete? Three ways to know that turns are complete. They can be complete by grammar, by intonation, or by action. We're thinking about these things as people talk in order to know when they're getting to the end of a turn, in order to know, ah, it might be my turn to talk soon. That's how we end up talking so quickly. One person talks and the other person talks off, uh, immediately afterward. You don't wait till the turn is over and then think, oh, it's my turn, what should I say? You know that someone is coming to the end of a turn because you're thinking of these things. So you're already aware that it's going to be your talk turn to talk. So you're ready to start as soon as the other person finishes. That's how we go back and forth so quickly, right? We don't only know someone's done 
when their mouth closes finally and stops making any more sound, we can see it coming ahead. Uh, gaze is also included as one of the ways that we know about turn completion, but gaze is not always necessary because of course you can have a successful conversation on the telephone when you can't see the other person at all. So let's leave that aside. So three ways we can see a turn is complete. Complete guy grammar, I finally found the thing. The USB stick? Yeah. The first turn has completed grammar, subject, verb, object. I, sub, subject, found, verb, the thing, object. There's some complete grammar there. How does B know that it's time to talk here? A said, I finally found the thing. Didn't ask B to do anything, didn't ask B to comment. A said, I finally found the thing. But B realizes, hmm, that's a complete grammatical turn. I finally found the thing. B realizes, well, I can talk now. There's no reason I have to. I wasn't asked to talk. But if I want this conversation to keep going, I can say something now. And, and I'm not going to interrupt because I can see that that turn's finished. Uh, stopping any early, right? If A said, I finally, B would be waiting. If I, if... If A said, I finally found the, B would be waiting because there's not enough grammar to work with there. But I found the, finally found the thing tells us, ah, there's enough grammar there. I can start talking now. Complete by intonation. Look at line two, right? A says, I finally found the thing. B says, the USB stick. Now, the USB stick on its own is a phrase. It doesn't have a verb, right? It doesn't have a subject or a verb. The USB stick. But because of the intonation, the rising intonation on stick, the USB stick, oh, that intonation helps A see that B is asking a question. It's not uh, grammatically an interrogative. An interrogative has to have the grammar to tell us it's a question, right? Uh, subject, verb, and version, I was there, was I there? This doesn't have that because there is no subject and verb, but it has intonation to show that B is asking a question. The USB stick, uh, good, right? That works as intonation contributing to seeing that B's turn is complete. A realizes I can talk now in line three. Um, I'm gonna skip over this uh, discussion of intonation. Uh, you can stop and read this if you want, but otherwise I'm gonna skip over it now for time because of time constraints uh, to focus on the main thing here, which is turn completion. Complete as an action, look at what happens in line three? Line two is a question. The USB stick? Line three, A just says, yeah. Is that enough at that point? Sure, because as an action, even though it's just one word, as an action, it's enough to progress this conversation. It's the action of answering the question. At this point in the conversation, that saying yeah makes sense, right? You can't just say yeah at random points in a conversation or the other person might not get what's going on. You can say, yeah, here, and B understands, ah, your turn is complete, and so it wouldn't be surprising for B to continue here. These C things, grammar, intonation, and action, are actually all happening at once on each turn. Each turn has grammar, each turn has intonation, each turn has action. It's something that you can read about to get more detail. I mean, the USB stick is a phrase and I said it doesn't have grammar. Well, it has elliptical grammar. Like B, what we know what B means here is you found the USB stick. So there's some borrowing of A's turn in line one. But if you want that amount of detail, you can look at the reading, right? But just the main thing to remember is we have turns. They are made up of units. We know that turns are finished according to our knowledge of grammar, intonation, and action. And even, I mean, everyone knows this. Even if you don't remember the grammatical terms, people don't always remember what's a phrase, what's a clause, what's the difference between a phrase and a clause. That doesn't matter. They have the knowledge of these things in their heads in order to use them to successfully participate in a conversation. People are good at projecting where a turn will be complete. They say things like, P says, and the fact is I, is I just thought it was so kind of stupid. Now, notice P could be finished there. The fact is, I thought it was so kind of stupid. That could be enough. P 
Pete did want to go on to say, I didn't even say. But it's not surprising that Jay starts to talk and therefore overlap after the word stupid, because it could be finished. The fact is, I thought it was so kind of stupid. Jay says, ah, that's complete by intonation, grammar, and action. I'm going to start talking now and goes, yeah. Then realizes P is continuing to talk and says, I didn't even say anything when I came home. What's happened here then? Jay's overlapped with P, but at a typical point where we'd expect it to happen. When this ha when this happens to us, when someone starts talking to us over top of us at the point where there is a unit is complete, we don't tend to get annoyed. We don't tend to think, oh, why is she trying to interrupt me? Why is he arguing with me? Because we accept that there are certain points in talk where it's more likely that one could be finished and that someone else could start talking. We call that a transition relevance place, as it says here. The place, the place in the conversation where it's relevant, possible, to transition, to change from one speaker to another. When there's a transition relevance place, people are more likely to talk, to start their turns, to attempt to start a turn than at other points. And we don't tend to hold that against them. We don't tend to think, stop being rude and interrupting me. Because we realize, again, without really thinking about it, I mean, it's conscious, but so quick, we realize they're not trying to interrupt us. I've color-coded it here, right? P's turn is, in fact, all of lines one and line one and two. But the red part could have been a satisfactory turn. But P did want to continue into the blue part. At that switch between red and blue, that's called a... TRP, Transition Relevance Place, that's where Jay says, I guess I'll start talking. You can see how that works here. Uh, you've been down here before. Someone might say that. You've been down here before. Now, A was continuing to say, haven't you? But B saw that you've been down here before, could function as a kind of question, and so already chose to respond at that point, yeah. Even though they overlapped, it's obvious B was fulfilling the yes-no part of A's implied question at the transition relevance point. Okay, I'll see you. All right, dear. Bye-bye. The all right could be a response. Okay, I'll see you. All right. A did plan to go on adding dear, but P projected the ending of the turn after all right and so said bye-bye. Bit of overlap, no surprise that nobody would get annoyed by that. I'm going to give you one to look at here for a minute. Identify the TCUs in the following. What you'll have to do here, if you really want to try this, is pause and think about all the places at which someone might stop talking. Not where she or he, well, they're both she here. Not when she did stop talking, but when she might have stopped talking. Those are the transition relevance points. So you've got to look at the turns, break them into units, and then see at what point could someone stop talking. Those are the TRPs. If you remember these two terms, TCUs, turn construction units, and TRPs, transition relevance places, you'll have a very good tool for discussing spoken language. Here's the TCUs. These are the units. What's your plans for tonight is a clause TCU. Tonight is a word to TCU, and glass of wine is a phrase TCU. So KM has one turn made of one unit. JK has one turn made of two units. Where are the TRPs? Where could someone change? Well, at the end of any unit. That's where you can change. What's your plans for tonight? You have to realize that KM could have kept going there. What's your plan for tonight, Jennifer? What's your plans for tonight after work? What's your plans for tonight? The turn could have continued there. It didn't, but it could have. But it was also possible to switch. What happened? JK decided to start talking there and say, tonight? Now, at that point, KM could have said, yes, tonight. But JK kept talking and said, glass of wine? We're not talking about what could have happened. We're talking about what did happen. But you have to always think that at any one of these points, this was not the only, po at any one of these TRPs, this was not the only possibility. That's the end of part one. If you can remember 
the key points, conversation is made up of segments. Each segment is made up of turns. Today, the real focus is on the fact that each turn can be made up of one or more units. The units can be called word, phrase, or clause turn construction units. Turns are finished by grammar, intonation, or action. And the points at which we might switch between speakers are called transition relevance places, TRPs. I know that's quite a bit, but if you can get that down, then as I said, you'll have a very successful, uh, you'll have a very good set of tools in order to successfully analyze spoken interactions and especially conversation. Thank you very much.